Uh, good evening, and thank you all for coming. Uh, those of you who can find a seat, uh, grab one. We are thrilled to have a uh, filled to overflowing house tonight for Louis uh, Palou and his uh, debut here at New America. Again, I'm Doug Ollivant. I'm a senior fellow with the National Security Studies Program. We're thrilled to have you all here tonight. Uh, we hope that you've uh, enjoyed your uh, socializing beforehand. Um, and I suppose without any uh, further ado, we'll just hand it over to Louis and let him talk about his work, and then we'll uh, get on with the show. Let's see, check this working. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody for coming out, especially uh, all my friends and colleagues, and I want to thank Doug for uh, agreeing to do this. And uh, Andres Martinez and all the my fellow fellows, part of the fellow program, have been really fantastic to work with. And I'm glad we can do this because my fellowship's actually from Mexico, but because the field work is ongoing and I'm not finished the project, this is sort of a, a great base to talk about how I approach doing long-term projects and how I'm working on Mexico at the time uh, right now, as, as showing my Kandahar work, which is what I showed uh, as an example of my work to get my fellowship here. Um, what I'm going to start with, can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Uh, if you can't see this, of course, those two monitors back there will uh, have everything as well. Um, what I'm going to do is, whenever I give a lecture, I try to make it something different so that it, you're not seeing the same thing all the time over the years. So what I did was, I'm kind of working on a secret project. It's a documentary film on Kandahar. I have lots of footage. And I met a filmmaker who, a year ago, said, hey, you know... That, you can make a film with that. So I edited a never seen before, except for a couple of people in the fellows program, uh, a little trailer that we're working on. It's very rough and early and some, some outtakes, some cut fo uncut footage. The important part about, I think, seeing the video before you see the photographs is because we all see these still photographs and you don't hear any sound. You don't know what anything looks like, what's happening, what the people sound like. And I think that a lot of times people look at these places on a map and you don't know what the place actually feels like and looks like. And I think the video gives a unique look into that. So it'll be a quick little trailer. It's about eight minutes altogether, and then some raw, uncut footage. Uh, th there's no interviews or anything like that put into the film yet. We're about a year's out from putting this out. So uh, anyway, if we could have the lights, this light here turned off. Uh, I'll, I'll start the uh, video. I'm just going to give you a little heads up. Uh, I think we all are aware that we're talking about a place where there's a current conflict going on. There are going to be some graphic photos. There's going to be some blood. There's going to be some, some dead people. So just be aware that you're going to be seeing that here tonight, all right? Uh, I think the thing I want you all to walk away from tonight is that the reason why I like to produce this work is it's all about having a dialogue. That's the great thing about New America. It's all about ideas and dialogue here. And I think that that's what I want to promote when you look at my work. Okay, volume...
So I just want to give you that uh, <coughs> that bit of video. Is this working? Check, check. Uh, just to give you an idea, when you look at the photos, what the uh, what's actually what everything's sounding like, and uh, we're gonna have to keep that. Uh, I guess it'll work. We'll see. 
Um, anyone who's a uh, student of history of the region has to excuse my really quick history lesson I'm going to give here, because I want to give everybody an understanding of what Kandahar is and, and how significant it is. It's the second largest city in Afghanistan. Uh, this is a map from uh, Alexander the Great's route, his invasion route. So here's Kandahar right here. Kaira Pass up here is Kabul. Persia, or Parthia, Iran is down here. India, this ends up becoming Pakistan. And I want you to focus on uh, this little triangular area here where Kandahar is because this is an old map from that charts Alexander the Great, like 330 BC, and we're gonna come back to that in modern times now. So this is a map of Afghanistan, modern map, here's Kandahar. Get my cursor out of the way. Uh, Helmand here, uh, Herat up here, Iran, Pakistan, the stands are up here. Uh, so here's, here's Kandahar, and I'm sorry I'm going so quick. So here's Kandahar, and I want you to notice, here's the Highway 1. This goes up to Herat, up to Iran. This comes down through Chaman. Here's Pakistan. Spin Boldak, major trade. You can understand that the entire economy of Afghanistan runs on this Highway 1, Ring Road, they call it. So if you blow up this highway, you turn the economy off, mostly of Afghanistan, because most of the trade travels by highway. So here's connecting from Pakistan and Iran up to Kabul. This is Ahmad Shah Durrani. He founded what was the Pashtun Empire. It's the main ethnicity in Afghanistan. Uh, the first capital of the modern state of Afghanistan was in Kandahar. It was moved to Kabul later on. And I just want to point all these points out so you understand sort of the significance of this place. When I went there, I just went to go cover Canada was going on their first combat mission since the Korean War. I had no idea how significant it was. This is the Battle of Maywand. One of these, you know, these things, the graveyard of empires, comes from this, one of these slaughters. Uh, when it was the second Anglo-Afghan war, when the Afghans slaughtered a British army out in Maywan district just west of Kandahar City. Uh, if you read this book, it's a really good book actually. Uh, this is written by a US general, or was it, I think a lieutenant colonel. And if you read the combat operations that the Russians did, the Western forces did all the identical combat operations in all the same areas and the insurgents attacked them all in the same way. Uh, the funny thing is when you go to the back to all the references, uh, Kabul and Kandahar, Kandahar has about three times as many references actually in this book over Kabul in terms of its significance. Mullah Omar, he started the Taliban movement in, in Kandahar, west of Kandahar city. This is Tarnak Farms after 9-11. Uh, this was Al-Qaeda's headquarters set up just outside Kandahar city. This was Bin Laden's compound down here. So remember that, that, that triangle I talked about? So here's Kandahar City. See this triangle right here? Here's Kandahar City. Now here's that same triangle, okay? Here's the Argandab River that runs right through it. And almost all the fighting in Kandahar province, the place where almost the biggest part of the surge that did any fighting went into this triangle right here. The same place, the same route that Alexander the Great went through, in the same shape. Actually, let me just go back for a sec. Sangasar, that's where Mullah Omar started the Taliban. There's Highway 1 right there. Hazi Madad, all the British troops that got slaughtered up in Maywand trickled down to here, and, and any survivors made it to Hazi Madad. Largest operation in NATO history before Helmand happened here called Operation Medusa. This was the first in 2006. This was, this was the first big battle where everybody's like, uh-oh, the insurgents are back. First large-scale operation launched when the insurgents came back in 2006 was uh, headed by Mullah Dadula, and it was like almost 200 suicide bombings in Kandahar City. That was the biggest campaign in the, entire of the, in the entirety of the country. Now let's get to the photos, which is, I just wanted to give some foundation there and understanding of, and I didn't know all this till over the years while I was there. So, uh, I got there in 2006, and it was during the suicide bombing campaign. This was like every day, every second day, uh, there were scenes like this. Suicide vehicles, su guys with suicide vests, and the surgency had definitely returned. But I don't think people realized every year is going to come back bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And definitely the East was taking a lot of heat as well. 
but the south was taking the most heat. And I think that a lot of times uh, the world was seeing the war through whatever country's troops were in that province. So Canadians saw Kandahar because Canada was in charge of Canada was charge of Kandahar. The British were in charge of Helmand, so all the British knew were Helmand. And the US mostly was RC East, the regional side all in the east. So every country was seeing the war by provinces, not by the whole country. So I think that there was a big disconnect sort of what was going on and what was happening where. For I think a lot of people back home, it was all the same place. Uh, Kandahar is surrounded by grape fields mostly, especially on the west side. It's the breadbasket of Afghanistan. There's a lot of underground agricultural and irrigation systems, which has made it a significant place for agriculture in the country. You walk through the grape fields all the time. This is a member of the Afghan army. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the Afghan army. I thought the best place to learn about the place is being with the Afghans, actually. But the funny part is most of the Afghan army was not from Kandahar. They were all from the north, actually. And it was a loyalty issue, I think, strategically. Uh, I spent a lot of time with the Canadians. Their mission was Kandahar from 2006 to 2011. Uh, Kandahar is very different. Everybody thinks deserts and mountains. Well, Kandahar, especially in those fighting districts, it's perfect for guerrilla warfare. So we're in a firefight right now in the middle of a grassy field. Swamps, forests, tree lines. It just seemed to never end. And uh, the grape fields were like a bunch of trenches. It was like World War I nonstop. This is your standard view of that. This is, this is in Panjway district, or sorry, Zari district. And it's just your standard agricultural farming area. Uh, there, there's some hills that, and mountains that pop up here and there. This is a road that the Canadians built called Summit Road. It connected uh, Highway 1 into the next district, Panjwe. And most of the buildings are built of mud. There's no electricity, no running water. The populations of these districts, Zari, Panjwe, Argandab, these are the three districts around Kandar City. No one could ever really count, but you know, 50, 60, maybe 80,000 per district, depending on when they cleared out, depending if there's fighting people moved to another area. Uh, detainees. Uh, Canadians caught a, a proportionately higher number of detainees, uh, not by any sort of policy, but I think that there are many more insurgents down in Kandahar that stayed in Kandahar and did not run across the Pakistan border all the time. Uh, the bottom half of the districts was desert. You couldn't really, it was very difficult to travel through there. Uh, these are Afghans in Hausi Madad. Uh, they're peeling potatoes and Afghans are really fascinating. They're really easy to photograph. I think a lot of Western troops are really aware all the time of being photographed, whereas the Afghans were not. And uh, they really let their guard down, which was fantastic. It took a lot longer to get to photograph Western troops because they were aware of the camera. This is sort of a standard scene. You never know who's who. Civilians, insurgents, you have no idea. So it was this constant sort of trust and distrust. You don't know who's who. Uh, th these are police, they're Hazaras, they're a small ethnicity in Afghanistan and one, one experiment was to bring a Hazara unit down in the midst of the Pashtun ethnicity uh, so that there could be no infiltration by the Taliban. Um, these are Mina birds and uh, they're common pets for Afghan army and police and it was like this nice little human moment in the middle of all this fighting every day. Uh, it was really nice to just see this guy was like singing and talking to these birds. They clip their wings so they can't fly away. Uh, these are Afghan police uh, unbinding the feet of two Afghan police who were hung and shot in the face by the Taliban. Uh, a common tactic is these two police actually, this is the, the I heard two stories. Is one, they, were, uh, they walked off the base, the Taliban kidnapped them, and uh, they were found the next day dead. Well, first they were hung in the, in the town to scare the local villagers. What happened is, is the two local police went out to try and rob two, two locals of their motorcycle. They, they disarmed them and gave them to the Taliban. And th th this was a common problem, is corruption in the, in the Afghan police force. And so the Taliban sort of sent the message like, hey, come to us if you have a problem. Don't go to the Western forces. Don't go to the government forces. We'll take care of your problems. This is right near Sangasar. It's a place, just between Sangasar, a place called Spin Pier. This is right near a place called Taliban Road, Contact Corner. There's all these nicknames for places. Uh, we're uh, about 50 meters from uh, insurgents right here. The insurgents, I would see, I had friends who covered the regional command, the east side. The firefight seemed further away. Here it was really flat, lots of vegetation, and the Taliban would fight a lot closer because their artillery and airstrikes were ineffective. What would happen a lot. So uh, this Afghan soldier is terrified because we're actually going to get overrun. We had to run about 400 meters back to the base. 
This is very rare. A lot of times the Taliban would totally be overwhelmed by Western forces. But this is what war was for me, the experience of war. It's fear. It's not just the bullets coming out of the guns. This is the white schoolhouse. There's these two white schoolhouses in, uh, uh, in Pashmul, right near Afghan uh, Kandahar City. Uh, one was completely destroyed. There were some famous battles there that Canadians were involved in. Uh, this is a common thing where the insurgents would set up in schools, attack the Western forces. They would fire back and destroy the schools, hence negating the whole building of the schools. Schools were a big target. It's all ideological. Uh, these are women begging outside of the, the, one of the most sacred uh, mosques and shrines in Afghanistan, if not the region. It's the mosque of the cloak of the Prophet Muhammad. This is a civilian who uh, was just walking down the road. Again, these are all in the districts west of Kandahar City. All the fighting happened in the rural areas. A lot of times I would hear people uh, from different, uh, either governmental or military organizations say, you know, if we take Kandahar City, we control the south. But really, you gotta control the rural areas if you're gonna control the city. If you don't control the rural areas, you cannot hold the city because the rural areas surround the city and then all the citizens feel like they're surrounded all the time. There's a stranglehold on them. Uh, what happens is the Taliban would ambush government troops, and they would fire back, and civilians get caught in the crossfire. That happens all the t a lot of the times, actually. Mostly with Afghan troops. Uh, I thought to understand Kandahar, you gotta go even to Helmand. Helmand, there's sort of a big connection between Kandahar and Helmand. They're connected, uh, the Argandab River, I mean, of course, rivers are very rare there, so anytime they're there, there's a lot of life along them, there's a lot of work along them because of jobs and agriculture. And I went to Helmand, and when the Marines returned in 2010, and I just wanted to sort of document what the experience is to go to, I mean, Helmand is a very difficult place to operate. Uh, it's 125 degrees, 55 degrees for people who are on metric. Uh, um, I'm from Canada, so we're metric, so I thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, but I went at the end of their tour, and uh, I just did these portraits every day after fighting and patrol, because I just wanted to capture the experience, which was a little more universal of any sort of soldier, or army, or fighter that goes to Afghanistan, what the experience is like. Because I think that the land and the challenge of the terrain is just as much your enemy as the people you're fighting there. And I think that that's why for centuries Afghanistan's such a, been such a difficult place to operate in in any way. Uh, even as a non-governmental organization, even if you're just doing development work, it's a very, very, very challenging place to operate. And anyone who's been there understands what I'm talking about. The average age of these Marines, 20, 21 years old. Uh, another thing I wanted to do was follow the route of Alexander the Great. He was one of the first major invaders, foreign invaders of Afghanistan. So I went up to uh, Farah and I sort of followed his route. This is in the Bujibas Pass. And these are areas that, you know, I'd be staying on a mountain and someone would say like, hey, you know, I got the GPS. This is where I think Alexander the Great started fighting first. And I'm, it, it, just, it just blew me away that I was following in the roots of Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great. And there are very few places in the world where you can go that you have that many Famous and infamous military leaders and armies and empires all go to the same place to invade, fight, control, fix, whatever they're trying to do there. Uh, it was so bad there. This is, there was a lot of fighting there. Uh, the Marines gave their interpreter handguns. They actually offered me a gun at one point. I just said I'll work the camera. But it just the threat was really bad. This is the top of the Bujibas Pass. And you can see if you're the army walking down the valley and you're up in the mountain, sort of all the different things that suit uh, armies that are fighting each other. These are Canadian troops in Zari district, which was a lot of fighting happened in Zari and Panjway district. Uh, this sort of, for me, is uh, twofold. It has that whole thing of enter the abyss, going into the dark place. This is a Karez. Th this is what makes Kandahar so important and so unique. It's an underground river system, you could say. Uh, in an irrigation system, and a lot of the Afghans, it's centuries old irrigation system. They dig down to find the root of the Karez and they divert the water into their fields. And that was, that's what makes Kandahar unique in, in such a, a, a massive way. Uh, the other thing too is that when the Russians left, the century old irrigation system, they did a scorched earth policy out in the districts because they were having such a hard time, and they destroyed centuries of irrigation which was controlled pretty much by shovels for centuries. This is in a madrasa in Kandahar City. I did a lot of work without the military. I thought it was important to uh, get outside of the military as much as possible as well. 
This is in Chalgor. This is one of the many villages where they were, where he started in 2010 conducting counterinsurgency operations. And what I started doing is, and you're wondering why there's this panoramic, I, I, I just, over years, I, I was shooting everything the same, and I thought, I want to start looking at space differently, and Afghanistan is such a unique place for its space, for what happens in those spaces, and how you occupy those spaces. And it's a toy Russian camera, and the lens moves from left to right, and it was filmed, so I didn't know what I was getting, and I would only shoot one or two frames per scene. And this is just, uh, they caught these two kids digging. This is a common thing. You see someone digging, and you're a soldier, they're planting a bomb or a landmine, usually, so... They've got one guy at the mine detector digging up the bomb. The guy in the center is taking forensic tests to see if he has explosive residue in his hands. And they've got his partner and they're crushing him separately on the right. But you can't normally do this with a regular 35 millimeter camera. It's this 120 degree field of view. And it's just another way of showing sort of the space and the, and, and the place. This is in Spin Boldak. You don't need a passport to really cross Spin Boldak. People just walk back and forth. Spin Boldak, Chayman, it's the Pakistan border south of Kandahar. Very strategic, important place. Uh, a lot of sort of training camps and, and sort of resources for uh, uh, the insurgency happen in Pakistan. Uh, these little boys, their job is to take these wheelbarrows and, and go back and forth carrying things across for people who can't carry them themselves. This is in Kandahar City. There's some local cabs. Local river system. You know, if when you ask someone in Kandahar what their base complaint is, it's not the violence. It doesn't come first. It's we want electricity. We want running water. And this is one of the main channels where you know, a lot of people don't have running water in their house. So this is sort of the water source for a lot of people. I did a lot of color photography. And I'm going to speed through this story because we got such a short amount of time. Um, this is during the Eid festival. That's henna stained on their hands. You know, when you're in a firefight, nature is ever present. And sort of the symbolism of nature in war is really important. When you're in a firefight, the, the crickets and the birds don't stop doing their thing. The birds are still chirping. They're flying around. Bugs are still walking around. So I just wanted to, to sort of have that sort of ever presence of what nature is and what it can symbolize and that nature itself can be cruel, just like the thorns are. I did uh, 150 medevac missions. I wanted to cover casualties, even civi civilian casualties. So in 2010, during the surge, I, I spent uh, several months with a US medevac crew. This is uh, about one second after an IED blast. By 2010, the insurgents had kind of realized that the IED was like the Stinger missile during the Russian war. And they started using it to, to, to their effect as much as they could. This IED was in a tree. They started making IEDs that would blow people's heads off. I spent a lot of time in trauma rooms on the front lines. These are three brothers who were blown up by an IED set by insurgents while walking their donkey. This is two US soldiers after an ambush. This is all in the back of a helicopter. This is after a mission in Argandab district. This is uh, your standard infantry soldier the morning before battle. And it's just the, the real how young guys were. As they got younger and younger over the years really struck me. This is uh, uh, after an IED attack at night. This is a casualty in the back of the helicopter. This is a casualty in Bandy Timor, which is a little stretch of land that connects Helmand province to Kandahar province. I just want to talk quickly about sort of how we consume our images. We, we see this is a lot of places where my pictures were, were published. But uh, this was a series on Newsweek. Uh, they, they wanted color for commercial reasons. I just want you to understand the social and the political choices that when photos are chosen, it's not just, hey, that looks cool, but that there are political and social implications to these things. So sort of like, you know, when you, when you have a, a headline embracing the Taliban, you have someone closing the eyes of a dead person. Sort of editorial choices. Photo editing, you know how you can connect sort of different visuals like, like the grass. The photo editor found that. I didn't find that, which goes to prove the importance of having good photo editors. Uh, th that's an IED or some old shells on the left. This photo on the right, would, no one would publish it in color, but actually no one would really publish it, period. But they would publish it in black and white. So the choice of using color or black and white for the, the politics of showing graphic pictures. I like this one. This is on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's like the guy's dreaming about the Jaguar up above. Sort of the play of ads. You know, I mean, this is, psychologically, this is how we experience pictures. And I really, I, this is, you know, I started talking to someone about this. And I think it's really, really important to consider what's on your page and what you're taking in. This is an exhibition of those Marines in Amsterdam. They made these see-through giant prints and hung them in the cathedral. Just going to show you some quick logistics. Uh, over, I was there on and off 
from 2006, 2010. And uh, I spent a lot, most of my time, I would eat and hang out with the Afghan army guys, not with the Western troops, because I wasn't going to really learn much from them. And I started out doing the, uh, looking like this and uh, fitting in as much as I could uh, for being with them. And this is in 2010 during the surge in the Argandab. And then I, I wanted to do work outside the military. And I'm really blessed with this Italian beard I can grow. This is in the Khyber Pass, but you have to understand that that hat and how I look here will not work in Kandahar and you would stand out. So you got to understand your scarves. This is when I was working in Kandahar City. My camera bag was a plastic bag and I would use, I mean, you have to look at how Afghans do things. I put duct tape on the handle because nothing is thrown away, right? And I used a pillowcase for my other camera bag. So I would spend a lot of time at police checkpoints and I would talk to them and they would tell me what's going on. Because when they would tell me things going on, I wasn't getting the spin from anybody. I knew exactly what was going on. I would watch operations from hills that, that the NATO would do with Afghan police. So I could watch it sort of as an observer. And the police would tell me what the insurgents were doing too. So I could get kind of both sides of what was going on. These are Afghan police. Uh, just at one of the checkpoints entering Kandahar City. This is uh, me in Argandab district. This is me and my, I worked with Afghan journalists. Uh, I, I don't believe in the whole two week parachute in and out. Sometimes that's the reality. But this is, we worked in Kandahar City extensively. Uh, this is my website if you want to follow up on my work. It's www.louispalou.com. You want to keep abreast of what I'm doing? Yes, I have a Facebook page, an artist page. You can click on that and that'll let you know what's up. And uh, I think now Doug will come up and we can chat. Hopefully I stuck to the time as much. I, sorry to bombard you with so much, but. Well, uh, after that presentation, bombard is the right word in several senses. But uh, let's, uh, you, you, you talked about it briefly in, in passing, but again, yeah, let's let you reiterate. Why Kandahar? Well, what ended up happening is uh, after 9-11, I think Afghanistan, if it wasn't on our minds, it definitely everybody knew about it. And uh, up through 2006, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Canada, and uh, up through 2006, uh, Canada had a general role somewhere in northern Afghanistan, known, you know, near Kabul. And then uh, Canada took on a combat role in, I think they announced it in 2005. And Canada hadn't taken on a combat role in any sort of outside of peacekeeping since the 50s in Korea. So it was like this major event as a Canadian that we're, gonna, we're going to combat. I mean, Canada's never really been attacked since like the War of 1812. So Canada's always gone to war. It's true, by, by the US yeah, actually. By <laughs> this is the centennial, I think, or some, <laughs> yeah, the bicentennial, the sorry, I, yeah. Uh, but, uh, which goes to prove, hey, maybe one day we'll be friends with the other side. I mean, who knows? Uh, but uh, I thought, wow, Canada's going to war. We always go to war to help other people, like the U.S., the British usually. And I thought, I want to see what's, I want to see what my country's going to do while they're there. So I immediately found out, I, I was working at a newspaper and I went, and I will be straight out. I had no idea how significant Kandahar was or what it was. I just knew it was a big city in the south. That's it. So, okay, so you kind of stumble into Kandahar, yep. you know, what, five years. Why, why so long? What, what kept your interest over this uh, duration of time? I, I think, I think there probably isn't a single person in this room who was affected in some way by 9-11. And I think that that was sort of the foundation of it. Uh, but it didn't drive me to want to go there yet. And uh, when I got there, I realized that I couldn't cover the war the way I thought it should be covered in a parachute style. And, and I don't mean to demean any other journalists who have to go in and out, because that's valuable as well, um, to do quick reporting like that. But I, liked, I wanted to do a long-term study. I wanted to keep looking at something over and over and over and over again, because I think that things reveal themselves if you look at them over time. And uh, after 2006, I got back, and uh, I already started plotting going back, and I already knew I was going to quit my staff job, and I was going to go on my own, and I wasn't going to have to, you know, a lot of times your editor will call you, and anyone who's in this room who's a photographer or writer gets this, the editor calls you and tells you the story from back in New York or Toronto or whatever, and you're on the ground, you're like, that's not actually what's happening here. But they're like, but that's the story we're going with. We just had the news meeting. And I just felt like I really wanted to say, hey, look, I'm going to stay here. And when I figure out the story, then I'll, I'll, I'll report it. And uh, I did sell stuff 
sort of on a per story basis. But over the years, as the pictures started coming together, they started telling a new story. They started explaining things more than just the bombings and the bodies. They started explaining the culture, the place, its history. And I, and I, I really think it became a unique story and a unique dialogue about the place. Talk to us about both how you split your time and what you learned and how you approached differently dealing with the, the Afghan army and police, mm -hmm. with Afghan civilians, and then you clearly spent a lot of time with the Canadians and a yep. little bit with the Marines as well. How were those experiences different and how did you approach them differently? Uh, well, the, the problem with working with, with Afghans, even if they're army, as much as we're, we're, we're hearing now about sort of some infiltration, by, you know, where some Afghans turn and shoot Western forces, is am I going to get kidnapped? And my primary role, goal, my, the thing I was most terrified of was one, that my fixer, and if you don't know what a fixer is, it's a local guide, a translator, a local journalist that helps you in the area you're working in if you're in a foreign place, is that he would be hurt or killed because he had a family, he had kids. And the first thing the insurgents, or the criminals, there's a lot of criminals there as well, just like anywhere else, do is they, they either kidnap you and take you or they kill them. And I, I just thought he is just as important as I am. And so every time we plan something, it, he was always in mind. With the Afghan army and police, there's some basic stuff like the guy with the rocket launcher, don't walk behind him. Because <laughs> if you get attacked, he'll just lift it up and start shooting and he'll blow your head off. Uh, but I think that um, what I had to do is I would go to the Afghan army's mullah and I would sit down with an interpreter and I would learn everything that was offensive and not offensive. These are really important things because little simple things would offend people, you know. You'd think, oh, come on. But, you know, it's a whole other culture and religion, a whole other history. So it's really important to learn. Such as? Uh, let's see. Um, don't go into their mosque. You know, I think, hey, let me go shoot some video in the mosque. You go ask. You have a sit down with the mullah and you get permission. And you, you say, you explain why you want to do it. Uh, I think that even uh, sort of images of women, you know, within the army, uh, what you show, what you don't show, what you talk about, what you don't talk about. And I think that religion is definitely something you have to be sensitive to. Uh, and uh, I, I think that, you know, we have a lot of, we have things where we joke around a lot, and for them, some of these things aren't jokes. And uh, they, they, could get, you, you, they could get offended very easily. And I, I really tried to uh, spend as much time with the army before going out into the, the districts as well. Like, hey, you go on a patrol, you drink lots of water. You, on an operation, you drink eight <laughs> liters. Well, what's the natural thing? You're going to have to go to the washroom. Well, you can't just, there's no washrooms out there. Like, you have to really plan what you're going to do. You can't just whip it out in the bush and go because, well, it sounds funny, but you, offend, you can offend an entire village. Entire village could be like, Western guys came here and they're peeing all over our town. And then that's the, that's the message that goes out. And suddenly, the entire town says they were naked and then the story gets switched around and you could cause an entire storm there. And the Taliban will use that as propaganda against you. Or hey, they were looking at our women. Some guy came in town and took a, photographed all our women. They're gonna photograph all our women and show what our women look like. Major problems. And then you become something that causes conflict. So I would write my name on the back of my helmet in Pashtu so everybody could call me and talk to me. And uh, I made little business cards with Pashtu information on one side, English information on the other so I could give it to them. So like, hey, this guy's putting an effort in. Good. You, you talked, a, a, again, in passing, you, you give us a lot of information about the various ethnic groups you interacted with mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. You the, the Pashtuns largely in the, the south. You had yep. the... The Afghan army, mostly Tajiks, coming from the yeah. north. You talked about the Hazara police that they brought down. What were your observations of the interaction between these groups uh, officially, their interaction with the population? Did this give you any hope for a post-ethnic Afghanistan? Well, I think that even within, it's very complex, because then there's even tribes within each of the ethnicities that sometimes are fighting each other. Uh, but say Pashtuns from Kandahar and Pashtuns from up north in Kabul, they're very different kinds of Pashtuns. And... There is definitely a prejudice from north to south, that's for sure. A lot of people, a lot of the guys in the army would be like, oh, people in Kandahar, they're not very educated. And right away, I'm like, come on, you know, I'm thinking, don't be prejudiced. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, the Hazaras were definitely, uh, they, they were slaughtered 
in, there is a number of cases where the Taliban slaughtered the Hazaras. There's some like almost ethnic cleansing. Right. So in some ways, you could bring down another ethnicity, and they're like, hey, it's payback time. Or you have the right kind of guy, and that, that you, police force was actually very, very, the New, York, uh, the New Yorker did a story on that base where I was at, and it was very fascinating. The problem is, is these guys can't speak Pashto. They come down, they're speaking our language. So sometimes they can't even communicate with the locals. I remember with my fixer, we're driving to Kandahar City, and they brought down police during the surge in 2010, and the police were from Kabul, and they spoke Dari, which is uh, a, a Persian-based language. And it's different from Pashto. And my fixer got into a fight with the police at the checkpoint. We we're going to get arrested because he was calling, he was telling off the guy from up north, hey, don't tell me in my city. You can't even speak my language. They started yelling at each other. And I thought, this is the classic little argument and fight and end up war in Afghanistan. Um, you're, you're clearly aware of a lot of the, you know, the ambiguity of so many of these situations. How do you go about capturing you know, ambiguity and in what's inherently a, a visual you know, somewhat unambiguous medium. How do you, how do you resolve the tension? I think, I think a lot of the times uh, is you have to spend a lot of time with people. After a while, you're there so much and you're photographing so much that the people that you're photographing are like, oh, that's just Louis. Or as the Afghans call me Mustafa, that's just Mustafa. He said, don't worry about it, he's fine. And I would eat with them. And, you, and like the Marines, I mean, it, I took, it took me a month to get those photos. The photos only took about two minutes to take, but I lived with them for a month. So I was with them every day. And I think that you have to demonstrate to people that you're willing to be, understand, and respect everything that they are and where they're from. And I think that uh, you got to be there every day, over and over, and go on patrols. I think some units I'd go on with every single section, I'd go like on eight patrols a day. And they thought I was insane, but I just thought I need to be out there as much as possible. Because even if you are against being embedded, there are areas of Kandahar that I don't care who you are, you cannot go out unembedded. It's just way, it's way too violent. Uh, you can't just hope for a battle, show up and take pictures objectively because you could be in the middle of it and get blown up real easy. They could think you're an insurgent from a drone and drop a bomb on you. So uh, I think that would look for a lot of subtle things. And I would try and be quick. And there are things you just, taking a photo, as much as a great photo, is our security risk or I would start a, a fight or a riot or I photographed a woman. So I would have to be really careful that I would have to just bite my tongue and just not take the photo sometimes. You were there from 2006 to 2010. You know, 2006 is just when the violence really yep. started uptick. I don't think the Canadians really understood that they were getting into. Um, you left around you know, 2010 when it's at its peak. You know, what was that like? What lessons did you take away? And, and what's your, uh, what, what are your thoughts on what that means for Kandahar and Afghanistan at large? Well, I think, it, it, I guess I just kept looking at it and I, and I always said, I'm not an expert. I, uh, these are just things I learned, and, and these are things I photographed and saw. But I just kept thinking, wow, this, there's just so much about this place that makes it such a significant place, its population. And I just felt like it was like this, from, from 2006, it was this buildup of like, oh yeah, okay, this place is important. We better put more troops or more resources here. And then by 2010, they're like, oh, of course Kandahar is really important. And kind of everybody kind of came together, and everything finally came in that it should have came in. But I think that uh, it's that it's almost sounded like a cliche. But if you don't study your history, you're destined to repeat it. And I think that when you look at some of the old maps and all the different people who went over the years and all the things that happened to them, hey, it was from spears to arrows to M16s to whatever weapon came after that. But pretty much history had kept repeating itself. And I think that the one difference right now that's going to make the biggest difference is to train an Afghan force and let an Afghan force deal with Afghans. So it's not, hey, you foreigners, hey, you Westerners. That, I think, is the solution. And I think that uh, development, building roads. You cannot go building, you can't, cannot go wrong building a road. The things that the insurgents could not blow up that was ideological was a road. Because once the, the locals got used to certain paved roads the Canadians built, they're like, hey, don't blow up that road. We got to get our stuff to market. We got to go to the city. So I think that you can't go wrong building infrastructure at all. And I think that uh, the road building and uh, read your history as thoroughly as possible. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that I'm technically sophisticated enough to ask this question, but someone asked me this beforehand, uh -oh. so I will. Uh, film versus digital, how did you balance this? How much do you work in, in really 35 millimeter and how many, how many times is it? This is a plant images? from one of my friends, this question, right? <laughs> okay, film and digital. You know, really, uh, in the end, I mean, without sort of the, the semantics and the small details of it, I don't care. I'm just there to take photos. It's, it's all just a, a tool. 
But I will say uh, the panoramics are film and everything else is digital. Now when I first started shooting there, I made everything black and white because I just wasn't very good at color. And as I got to know color, uh, it made a difference in the field because I'm out there for like four or five months in the middle of nowhere. I can't, there's no Kodak store. Like, you know, having memory cards was very helpful and moving pictures, selling pictures and having revenue come in to pay bills, pay my Afghan employees is very, very important. Uh, I think that film conceptually and psychologically is very important because you don't know what you got. The way you're thinking is you're like, did I get that? I don't know. But it, the problem is, is there's an interruption in the creative process with digital is because you do something what we speak disparagingly of, the term we use in the professional photo, we call it chimping. Because you're like a little monkey looking at the back of your camera there. <laughs> you, me, me included, right? Instead of just shooting and then like, okay, like you're just letting your flow, you're letting it go. Like just keep shooting, just keep thinking about the picture. So I think the choice of camera is an important one, whether it's film or digital. And I think that your approach is very, very different, especially from the generation. I know I have a few gray-haired friends in the audience here. I won't point you out, who started with film. And in the end, we're all achieving sort of an excellence that's our own personal goal for image making. But I think that the, 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 the image making with film was very, very different because there was a process where you did not know what you get and you kept shooting and focusing on the scene instead of going, ooh, I got it, let me go move this picture. And then there's the whole, let me go file right away. There's this pressure to move pictures like, hurry up, get me that photo, I need it on the line right away. You know, in the film days or when I'm shooting film, I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to keep following this thing. And there's some picture an hour, two hours later that, that you miss because you're in a hurry to go send your picture somewhere. So uh, I say both. I like both. And I still very much still use film. I think the choice of larger format cameras isn't because it's cool or it's different. I think that psychologically the way you approach taking the photograph is different. And that's the way I like to use the camera. Great. Can you uh, briefly tell us about your, your follow-on project and what you're doing in Mexico and how the lessons that you took from, from Kandahar are playing there? Okay. Uh, my fellowship that I'm working on now is Mexico, and I'm focusing on the border. Of course, uh, it's all in the news. There are things I have to cover, like the violence in Mexico. But there are also uh, social economic issues in Mexico that I think get overlooked and get drowned by, by the whole over coverage of, of, and there is a lot of killing going on there, definitely. But I think that we're not really learning from just seeing bodies. I think that we need to learn about what Mexico is, what its history is, what its visual history is. L look at the history of what Mexico I is in pictures. If you look at the famous painters and the people who have depicted Mexico, violent death and oppressed workers. And that's still very much happening today. And I think that Mexico is probably one of the most important countries strategically to the United States in the world. And I think that if people aren't paying attention to Mexico, they don't realize that if you turn Mexico off, you pretty much, you could collapse the U.S. economy by turning Mexico off. Vitally important. As well, you know, what's funny is the United States has Canada and Mexico, and I'm not speaking because I'm Canadian, but imagine taking those two major trading partners away. I mean, Mexico is a security gate from the rest of Central and South America to the United States. I mean, when you think of the, the billions of dollars of trade that come from Mexico, uh, it, that affects the daily lives of almost every American, everything that comes through Mexico, either manufacturing, trade, uh, the economy, and same with Canada. 39 states in the U.S., their primary trading partner is Canada or Mexico. So I'm working on it. I am not going to show it. And it's learning from Kandahar is it's a, looking at things differently, not just going in there for two weeks and coming out and saying, hey, this is what I saw in two weeks is getting to know the situation and watching it develop over months gives you a different view of what's happening somewhere. And that's what I learned from Canada, actually. Okay, great. As, uh, as we wrap up, uh, what did I not ask you that I should have? <laughs> oh, geez, you gotta give me that. I'm good with pictures, but um, what did you not ask me? Actually, you know, I'd like to ask you now, uh, a lot of you may not realize, but he worked in the Eastern side in the US Army, up in the East. And, and one of the things that I, I thought was very interesting was Afghanistan was this sort of the, one of the first big contemporary sort of international tries at, at, at con fighting a war development and different countries took different areas. And I always wondered, you know, I went up to the east and I always wondered, and I almost don't want to turn it on you, but seeing Kandahar and being up in the east, there, there were such different places. The people were different, the culture was different, the fighting was different, the insurgencies, the insurgents and the leaders were different. 
what sort of, what did you come away from, you know, sort of understanding? So we're talking about the eastern side of Afghanistan and Kabul's up in the north, and it's the south and the east where most of all the fighting is happening. And what would you sort of, what, what would you sort of reflect on sort of seeing what you saw from here and sort of being in the east and what you're doing up in the east? Yeah, I mean, I think our, uh, our experiences are similar in that you've got the, the places divided and you have different, nationali different nationalities working in these different areas that are so different. The, the far west, you have Herat, which is very Iranian influence, and you have the Italians outworking that. And the north is very tied to the former Soviet stands, to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and the Germans are up there. And then the east, very tied to, to Pakistan, uh, as is the south. Um, but the, the Americans were there, and then the South was run by the Canadians, and then very lately transitioned to the Americans. And so you had not only the different national colors of each, each intervener, but you had different cultures uh, within Afghanistan. And it just, it just made it so hard to put it all together. And, you, and you're right, the East is, is very different, and that there's none of the jungle-like vegetation you saw. It's much cooler, much more temperate, much more mountainous. The engagements were further away. Um, the Tajiks and Uzbeks were much more intermingled with the Pashtuns. Um, it, it was just different. All right. Um, with that, we're, we're not going to take audience questions because we're going to not let him leave here until 7 o'clock. We have an open bar. We have, uh, and, and he is at your mercy here uh, in the front. Um, we want to thank you all for coming. We've enjoyed this discussion. And again, Pleased to have him here. Really appreciate his Kandahar work. Look forward to seeing Mexico. And again, thank you all for coming out tonight. And we will not let him leave until 7 o'clock. So feel free to accost him with all your questions. <laughs>